Okay, perfect. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully, everyone had a good weekend. Um, I hope that my voice won't give way halfway. Uh, I spent most of the weekend in a hockey rink sharing some kids, so my voice is a bit uh, rattled today. But uh, anyways, that's my excuse. Uh, today, we're going to do something very, very different in terms of the content. We will change scale completely and even topic to some extent. And the reason I'm doing this is uh, we will transition as of next week into a, another theme altogether, into seismogenic zone and looking at faults and earthquakes with Yajing from McGill. And uh, so what I want to do today is start thinking a little bit broader scale and uh, think about orogenic models, how mountain belts evolve with time and looking at various models. And in doing so, I want to introduce a couple of uh, concepts that may appear to be basic at the start, like exhumation, but can turn into a very complicated pattern if we're coupling exhumation, erosion, and tectonics and active faulting. So all of these things will sort of play together and later on in the term, and I know with uh, Lindsay Schoenbaum's uh, presentation towards the end of term, looking at tectonic geomorphology, some of these concepts that I will be presenting today will come back as well. So, um, so that's essentially the overall uh, scope of this. I'm gonna talk about three main themes today. So, uh, first of all, a broad introduction into modeling. What are models? What are they good for? Why do we model in the first place? Then move into orogenic models. And, and finally, in the second half, in the second hour here, talk about exhumation processes and how they intertwine with orogenic processes itself. So, the image that you see right here, this chap here is Henry Cadell. He was part of this uh, massive undertaking uh, of the British Geological Survey in northern Scotland, mapping the Moen Thrust. You guys remember Charles Lapworth, the, the, the guy that coined the term Mileneck for the first time and kind of lost his marbles uh, in the process. Well, Henry Cadell was part of that group as well. and. And what they were trying to do, and, and as they were progressing with their map, they started realizing that they were dealing with a major thrust structure. Concept of rocks moving hundreds of kilometers over another package of rock, over thrusting it, creating topography, and creating faults in the process. And in the late 1900s, that was quite something to try to wrap your head around. And um, so Henry Cadell uh, got a huge research grant and uh, bought himself a wheelbarrow <laughs> and a uh, bucket of sand and built this very simple apparatus, uh, essentially a box with uh, a glass side in which he laid some, uh, some sand in fine layers and then used this uh, high-end screw and uh, impose a strain rate to the system that was probably not constant and shortened all this horizontally layered stratigraphy to see what would happen. And of course you put in a buttress here that was being pushed by this, uh, by the vise and produced a series of thrusts and folds in the process. And the idea here was to try to recreate or find a way to recreate dynamically what they were observing in the field. And uh, this is probably one of the earliest tectonic or origin scale models uh, that we know, and that was done in 1899. So <clears throat> this comes to uh, probably my introduction now for what is a model and why do we model in the first place. And we all go to many lectures, we go to talks, to conferences, we read papers. The word model comes back over and over again. And we use it so often that more often than not, I think people lose the meaning of the term. And uh, 
For those contemplating doing a uh, uh, graduate studies at Queen's and if you're doing a PhD comprehensive exam and you're unlucky enough to have me on the committee <laughs> and if you um, mention the word model in your thesis proposal chances are you will get a question from me <clears throat> and what are these two questions you know what is a model and why do we model and I start this discussion with a cross section here a south to north cross section across the southern flanks of the Himalaya right here this would be the Himalayan range right here, all the way into the southern part of the Tibetan Plateau, all the way to the nor northern part of the Tibetan Plateau. So this is a crustal scale cross section that is a model, just like any geological map is a model. The idea here is that a model is just a proposed explanation for a system. Interchangeably, we could use hypothesis for this. So the geological model that you see here, the cross-section, is, is a representation of a lot of elements that are not directly observed. For example, the Indian lower lithosphere subducting underneath southern Tibet is, is an interpretation based on some data, some geophysical data, but no one has been able to put their finger on it directly. Okay. Uh, the same way if you're doing or recreating Henry Cadell's experiment using uh, multicolored sands, for example, and you're producing a series of fold and thrusts, what you're doing here is you're, you're recreating a sequence of events in a dynamic sense with an experiment to try to explain the generation of multiple thrusts. For example, you have a beautiful duplex stacking in the interland part of the model right here. And the model, at least here in the sandbox model, enables you to recreate time sequence of events. Remember that when we do geology, we go in the field, and let's say we walk right here to study um, this thrust right there, you see the finite component of deformation there. You see a fault with a reverse sense the northern block moving over the southern block, for example, right here, but you have no idea really how long this fault lasted and exactly how did it operate through time. So analog model using sands, for example, and you can film, you can take series of pictures, you can recreate the component of time, for example. We could simplify a system with equations. So we could do numerical model to simplify um, a system. So there's all sorts of models out there, is the idea here. Um, another way of defining what models are is they're essentially tools to try to, and it, to describe a complex system in a simple way. So I'm a s simple person. I don't like complicated answers. Um, I truly believe in uh, Occam's razor, right, simplicity. Try to explain as many elements possible with the fewer parameters. That is probably what constitutes a very strong model. So, so there are tools, and, and we use that to increase our understanding of a geometry, for example, a process, or controlling factors. What influence, for example, the dev development of all these faults here, right? Are they due to the underplating of North China lithosphere? Are they due to thin skin tectonics, for example? This word here is very important to models. Heuristic. Modeling is a heuristic exercise. What does heuristic mean? Any idea? Um, heuristic means to think. So we model to make us think about processes. And when we do this, we want to model or we want to think about models that have certain qualities to them. Certain models uh, could be good and some models could be bad. And so now what I want to do is focus on these terms here, 
in terms of models. And you can apply that to any kind of model, whether the gravitational uh, model of, uh, of planet Earth, uh, any kind of a hypothesis that you can think of. A good model is a model that is consistent, good, and accurate. A good model is not necessarily unique. So a good model is, or a good hypothesis is not a unique solution. It doesn't have to be. A good model doesn't have to be precise either. And as a reminder of what the difference is between accuracy and precision here, we have two targets. And I'm sure Dan Gibson, when he will talk to you about geochronology in the later on in this term, will come back to these uh, distinctions. Accuracy, so for example, you're shooting four arrows or you're shooting or <clears throat> in, this, in this target here. You're in the ballpark of the bullseye, but never in the middle. You're centering around the bullseye, somewhat accurate, but all four shots are in different places. So you don't have precision here. In this one here, right, all four shots fall in the same place. They're precise shots, but they're not accurate as in they don't fall in the center of your target. When we do good models, we want this. We want to fall in the general ballpark. Even if we replicate the model and uh, the experiment, for example, and we don't come up with the same thing over and over again, it doesn't mean our model is bad as long as what we're trying to, um, to image is still falls in the ballpark of the process we're looking at. Does that make sense? So, in geology, why do we model? Well, simply put, what we're looking at from the field observation is one, a finite picture, right? The rocks are not moving unless you're looking at an active fault during an earthquake you're not seeing rocks moving. If you are, well, um, <coughs> yeah, there's other issues. <laughs> Two, so there's the concept of time here that we're missing when we're looking at finite, uh, a finite deformation feature in an outcrop. Two, what we're looking at is very much fragmentary. If we're looking at an orogenic system, for example, there's a lot of components that are not there anymore, that have been removed from the system by erosion, for example. Two, think of this cross-section here. About 99% of this model here lies underneath the surface, inaccessible to direct observation. And so burial, for example, in terms of geological process, also hides part of the rock record so we need some kind of model to interpret what's underneath at depth without necessarily directly observing it. And finally, this is probably the most important aspect of a model, is we want to separate what's physically possible to what's just downright impossible. That does not mean that our model is right. Though. And in fact, most models just like any cross-section or any geological map, is an iteration process. You come back 20 years later with a better understanding of certain things and suddenly your cross-section looks very different. Or your map, or even um, uh, your numerical approach or your analog modeling approach. So, what does what are the characteristics of a good model? Kind of simplified here into three points. A high OP ratio. High OP stands for observation versus parameter. So you're trying to explain as many observational features that you can with the fewest parameters possible. Okay, the law of simplicity, Occam's razor. The model needs to be powerful and can be used to make predictions. And most importantly, like any hypothesis, it needs to be testable. If it's not testable, pack your bags. You're not really looking at a 
scientific hypothesis or a model. None of these require precision, and most importantly, we do this to make us think about things. Okay? So, uh, in my lab, uh, we use analog centrifuge modeling approach uh, occasionally to try to think about organic processes. Um, for example, we ran a summer's worth of experiments uh, a while back with, uh, I had a, an undergraduate student working for me in the summer, Chris Yakumchuk, and um, we did, I think, close to 70 experiments over the summer using silicon, silly putties, putting in the centrifuge. Out of those 70, probably 60 of those experiments blew up, literally. Silly putty flying all over the place, a little bit of a mess. Um, and I remember the first couple of weeks of Chris working, being completely depressed, going, this is a failure. It's not working. And I'm, I was next to him, and I was excited by every single model that blew up. Uh, <laughs> and one, because it was cool, but two, it's like, now hold on, Chris. Let's think about this. Why isn't it working? So every model that fails is probably even more important than the model that appears to succeed. Because out of failure, you, think, you start thinking about, well, maybe the parameters are not right, maybe the rheology of the material is not right, the strain rate, and then you reflect back on the prototype that you're trying to replicate. So this heuristic exercise is probably the most powerful component of modeling. And, and I see this very often, especially here in Queens, because we have groups that are dedicated modelers. Don't fall in love with your model. And the model is just one of many explanations. You could tweak the numbers, especially if you're doing numerical model, and come up with a very similar answer at the end just by changing some of the parameters of your model. Okay? So the model is not the end solution, is what I'm trying to get at. So this is what we're trying to achieve. We want to fall in the ballpark and, and find as many um, or explain as many observations as we can with the fewest parameters possible. Okay, so with this introduction to models, from now on, I'm going to talk about orogenic models. And of course, don't believe a word I'm saying, because we're talking about models at this point, which are uh, simplifications of reality. Some will be better, some will be um, weaker. So before we talk about models, I want to talk about the different types of origins. Origins simply means mountain belts. And if we just travel around the world right now and look at all the different mountain belts uh, where we have significant topo topography, um, I've got three cases here. This is a somewhat rotated map of the western Cordillera, Vancouver Island right here. There's the uh, Alaska uh, Yukon BC border right here. This is the Canadian Cordillera, and all these different colors represent various exotic terrains that have accreted onto North America. This is not a continent continent collisional setting here. The topography is generated by the accretion of multiple exotic terrains that are brought into contact with North America along a subduction system off the coast of North America. So this is what we call an accretionary type origin. If we move south towards South America and we're in the Andes, of course we have significant topography there too. Contrary to the Northern Cordillera, what we have here is the buildup of topography is very much assisted by a lot of magmatic processes, a lot of huge batholith produced by the, the subducting oceanic slab going underneath South America. There is deformation, there is thrusting as well, but the topography in the Andes is directly related to magmatic processes at depth. This is what we call an Andean type origin. And here we have very significant, usually calcalkaline and geochemistry batholiths forming the core of the mountain belt. And then finally, if we go in the Himalaya, 
Well, here's the prototypical example of a continent, co continent collision, okay, where we have India and Asia, and in between we have whatever was stuck in between, oceanic rocks, uh, continental shelf sediments, exotic terrain, everything squeezed in between two major continental crust blocks and we form a huge mountain belt in the process. I wrote here can be transitional. <coughs> we could have components in the Canadian Cordillera or components in time where the origin was an Andean type origin becoming accretionary with the arrival of exotic terrain, going back to Andean type until we culminate into a Himalayan type collision. If we look back at the evolutionary system of the Himalaya, some components, namely in the Cretaceous, the Himalaya was in fact an Andean type origin before becoming a continent continent collision. So we can switch back and forth, but the culmination and end member of the system would be a continent-continent collision. If we start thinking about how to classify origins now, so of course we can look at the main processes, accretionary, magmatic um, processes. We can also look at the magnitude of the, of the origin. If we think about the Alps, for example, it's a fairly small orogenic system in terms of lateral extent. It's also fairly small in terms of crustal thickness and fairly cold in terms of thermal processes. We compare that to the very large Himalayan system which extends thousands of kilometers that has produced a huge uh, continental plateau in the Tibet area and is underlain by significant thermomechanical um, system underneath the depth generating significant heat as well. So we could start thinking about origins in terms of magnitude and temperature. So before I go too far into the classification of origins, again, let's step back at sort of a general geometry of orogenic systems. So here I have a cross section from uh, the Vanderplume Marshak textbook. So this is just a a summary of your typical model origin, where you have uh, plate A, plate B, two continental components that have uh, collided with each other. <clears throat> All these rocks here from separated by these black lines are individual crustal blocks. Sutures usually mark the remnant of oceanic crust. And that's usually the line between two major continental plates. You'll notice right away that this origin is bivergent, meaning that we have components here, the thrust are moving to the right, and we have elements here of thrust going to the left. Okay, so it's a bivergent system. So if we think about foreland fold thrust belts, typical of the Canadian Rockies where we see thin skin tectonics. In fact, in a full crustal scale uh, orogenic section, you have two forelands. And these two forelands are on either end of the biverging thrust system. And in the middle, usually is where we find the high metamorphic grade rocks, which we refer to as the hinterland. So this is a typical horizontal zonation pattern that you'll see in most origins. We could think also about a vertical zonation uh, in the same type of origin. And for this, we use the two terms infrastructure and superstructure. Infrastructure refers to the components of the origin where the processes are at mid crustal depth and lower, usually ductile, melt-assisted processes, you see all these migmatite layers here, where you have thermal mechanical processes operating. The superstructure refers to the upper crustal component of the origin, usually in the brittle uh, world, where you see the development of these full thrust belt systems, such as these ones here in Wyoming. 
Okay, so there's a horizontal zonation and a vertical zonation happening as well. So for example, in this cross section here, the hinterland rocks here, the high metamorphic grade rocks were more, or less, more than <coughs> likely deformed when they were sitting down in the infrastructure and then were later exhumed to the surface and make up the core of the mountain bed. From a temporal perspective also, large origins evolve. They can evolve in a uh, oceanic continental collision system, generation of an accretionary prism, uh, abduction of oceanic crust, usually in the early stages of an origin, culminating into continent-continent collision right here, where you have significant lithospheric thickening and uh, significant thrusting. And again, notice the divergent nature of this origin. And then just like any good thing, right, origins will die and collapse. And especially if you've had significant thickening of the orogenic system leading to melting in the core of the origin, at one point the origin will become too thick and too weak in its core to support the major crustal thickness that was being produced. So in that part, we now get into what's called the orogenic collapse phase of the system. And you start, the, the gravitational potential overcomes the system, and then the origin starts laterally spreading and decaying and dying. And you be the judge whether this is a good model or not. Um, Selvelston produced this figure. This was actually published. Uh, this is a model using cheese trying to replicate the uh, evolutionary stages of an origin where it's mechanical uh, driven right here where you have two rigid Gouda blocks squeezing this um, uh, malleable brie and then at one point everything gets weak, too thick, too weak, too, um, and too hot and then the brie starts collapsing and spreading laterally. So, in my book, a model that you can eat is probably a good model. <clears throat> so, uh, again, thinking about this mechanical process versus thermomechanical uh, process, depending on if you have a small cold origin or a large and hot origin, what you will model and try to re replicate, you will use very different processes. Small and cold origins, you could probably replicate using sand, using Coulomb rheology, deforming, for example, you know, the, the snow and the shovel technique here, where you develop a full thrust belt in a critical taper geometry. We'll come back to the critical taper model in a couple of slides. And in this model here, what it predicts is that we'll generate the older thrust in the hinterland and as the system evolves, thrust will become younger and younger as they move towards the foreland. This is what we call a foreland propagating system. When you're dealing with a large hot origin, things do not seem to operate the same way. So here we have a sequence of, of uh, diagrams here showing an initial system that behaves mechanically where you generate the older thrust in the back and the younger thrust in the foreland. So initially the system behaves mechanically similarly to um, the snowplow, but then at one point the crust becomes thick enough that the lower part of the crust starts to weaken and generate melts. Where do you think the heat comes from? A thin crust versus a thick continental crust. Why is the thick crust, continental crust, warmer? Or can generate more heat? Where is the heat coming from? Any idea? Anyone? Simon Fraser, Miguel. Yeah. 
You have to radioactive go. elements. Okay, radioactive generated heat. So in a continental crust, right, we have a lot of material that will undergo radio, <coughs> radioactive decay. And that process generates heat. And if there's long enough incubation, the heat will build up and will start to weaken the mid-crustal layer. <coughs> and when that happens, something really weird starts happening, and suddenly you have a zone in mid-crustal level that becomes weaker that can then localize deformation. So when the system is operating mechanically, we have old thrust propagating foreland, and at one point when the system becomes weak enough, we start localizing deformation in the infrastructure. So suddenly the age relationship of deformation progresses from older in the superstructure to younger in the infrastructure because the infrastructure starts to activate. So the final picture that we could see in the large hot origin is you could have somewhat brittle thrust systems where the oldest thrust is in the hinterland, the youngest or some of the younger thrust in the foreland, and even younger shear zones, ductile shear zones, activated in the infrastructure because of this decoupling induced by a thermally activated layer. Okay, okay so <clears throat> let's talk about the brittle model for orogenesis. And this is the critical taper model. And this is something I know that I, I talk about quite a bit in my intro structural course. I don't want to go through the whole details of this. Uh, but this is a fairly elegant, simple model to explain the geometry that we see in most accretionary prisms around the world, whether or not this is a cross-section from the Taiwanese accretionary prism, you could be looking at the Barbados accretionary prism, uh, the foreland full thrust belt of the Rockies or the Appalachians. The cross-sections would look very, very similar where you have a basal detachment and, and foreland propagating thrust systems with fault-related folding such as fault bent folds and fault propagation folds. Okay. And <clears throat> this overall geometry defines a triangle, a wedge shape that we call the critical taper. And this angle, the lower part that represents the basal detachment and the upper part that represents the topographic surface here, is controlled by, of course, the geometry of the internal faults in the system, and which is a direct function of the strength of the material, the frictional component of the basal detachment, and, of course, the dip of the basal detachment itself. Okay? So that works well for this component of a large origin. Okay? I've put a little box here in the corner, problems, question mark. What are the problems or limitations of this? Whenever you do a model, it's good to keep the heuristic approach in mind. If it looks good, let's think about it now. Okay? So, here's Henry Cadell. I didn't want to do this. Uh -huh. Let's do that again. What happened? Uh oh. Uh oh. Hold on. <laughs> Coming back. Okay, it's there. Just want to hit the mute button and I hit the wrong thing. Here's our critical taper problem. Okay? This is an accretionary prism formation. As I put this on for the bullet, it's a phraser. Um, this is snow, by the way. Um, and as you can see, right, 
deformation up against the foreland or to us, right, due to the motion of this the shovel. Okay? Now, before we talk about the problems here, let's talk about the beauty of this model. Uh -oh. It's fine. Get it back. Okay. So, the, the model itself explains beautifully, you know, shoveling snow explains beautifully geometries of most accretionary prism, right? It also explains well the temporal evolution of the systems. So it is a good model in that regard. However, if you're looking at large organic processes, I've, ended, I've listed here four major pitfalls of this model. The first concerns the, um, the lack of subaerial processes, such as erosion. Okay? Not necessarily directly uh, linked to this model. Very importantly, the indenter, which is the size or the height of the shovel, has to be much greater than the material being pushed. There's absolutely no migration of material over the backstop in any of these models. Okay? The deformation is occurring in a single uniform virgins propagating towards the foreland. And finally, in this critical tapered system, everything is mechanical. There are no thermal processes operating at all. Okay? So, if we're trying to explain an entire orogenic system with a bulldozer, we fail. Because there are many, many key elements in the system that we simply cannot explain with a simple Coulomb rheology and deforming sand. Okay? What we have to keep in mind during large-scale orogenesis is the height of the backstop is essentially the same as the height of the undeformed material. If we start with a system like this here, okay, the general thickness here of continental plate A and the general uh, thickness here of plate B is roughly the same. Okay? And because this buttress ratio to thickness of sedimentary rock being deformed is about the same, material is allowed, and in fact, if this is what we see and we observe this, material migrates from one side of the origin to the other. Okay? The backstop is permeable in that regard. Okay? Hmm. And finally, and this is just by looking all the cross sections around the world, origins are double-sided. Okay, they not only verge one way, they go both ways. Okay. So, the initial stage of most origins starts in an asymmetric fashion. We start with the subduction system. The subduction system has a polarity. So, right at the onset of orogenesis, we build up an asymmetry. And this is the case of the early stages of the alpine system. We have a continental subduction system operating, generating a single verging deformation in initial stages, okay, and everything here in the cover is verging towards the left here, okay. If you go in the later stages of the orogenic uh, system, in the alpine system, we still have this uh, asymmetric subduction but then what we see in the surface, or in the upper crustal part of the origin, we still have the left verging thrust, but we start picking up deformation that's verging the other way as well, okay? Going both ways. Something we do not see in the uh, simple snow shoveling critical taper model. So, of course, this was known. This was uh, known that this was a limit, a uh, limitation of this. And here is a series of sketches from a very elegant and also very simple model by Jacques Malavier in the 1980s. And 
this is work that was done in France, and um, these guys were concerned by this, this conundrum that most origins are bivergent, and what they were, modeled was essentially using a sandbox, sandbox model. Okay, here's the layered sand right there. And instead of having a buttress pushing the sand, the deformation is generated by an, a mylar sheet that drags underneath the sand and then disappears into the apparatus right here, into a continental subduction zone. Okay. So with the handle right here, a crank, pulling the mylar sheet, and then it disappears, just like my slideshow, that keeps disappearing. Excuse me, technical difficulties here. Okay, we're back. Okay. What drives deformation here and the shortening is the mylar sheet that's disappearing underneath here that's pulling this block, this, these sand layers here into a convergence zone right here. And very quickly, the system develops two wedges, a pro wedge and a retro wedge. We'll define the pro wedge as the, the wedge, if you wish, I think there's about halfway here. There's a wedge right there and another one there. The pro wedge develops on the side that's being subducted underneath the other plate. Okay? The retro wedge is the wedge, the deforming wedge developed on the, um, the plate above the subduction system. And these two wedges will evolve very, very differently. You'll notice that one, right, in the final stage here, we have a much larger O wedge being developed with an angle that's smaller than the retro wedge. Okay? And for those of you fortunate to be at Queens, if you go to the Miller Museum, uh, we have in the department, this picture here is from the Miller Museum. We recreated this experiment, and then we uh, uh, epoxied the sand and sliced it and put it in the museum. And here you see beautifully the same sort of pro wedge side right there and the retro wedge um, taper right there. Okay. So this is using more Coulomb rheology, so dry sand with a very uh, uh, consistent internal friction angle of 30 degrees and so forth, and uh, using mylar sheet to drive deformation. What do you think here is not modeled at all? No water. Water? Okay, yeah, no water. What could water do? Cause it to slip more. Okay, so water could affect the properties of the fault zones, for sure. What else? What could water do? The pile of sand. Stick it together. If it rained on this, what do you think ha would happen? Okay, there's no erosion. Okay. Another thing. What else is not happening here? Real systems don't have constant rheology. Okay, constant rheology. Absolutely. It's a, it's a simplification. What else? Well, subduction is occurring, so it's not taking into account any heat. So. Okay, no heat. Absolutely. There's no thermal evolution of the system. What else? The thickness on either side, side is the same. Okay, the thickness on either side is the same uh, after deformation or pre-deformation? Pre. Well, okay, so this is using you know the, the simplification that two undeformed continental crusts would have about 30 kilometers. Right? But that could be not real. Group. If you're doing this experiment on your desktop or in your lab in Montreal or in Vancouver, Toronto or Kingston, and you're doing this and the model is, look at the scale here, but this is 30 centimeters of shortening, right? Meaning this is probably, I don't know, 20 centimeters high. What else here is not modeled accurately? The effect of gravity? Gravity, absolutely. Okay, so this is a big limitation to this as well. 
gravity here in this model is 9.8. Gravity in the full-fledged Himalayan system is also 9.8. Okay? So um, you can use this model simplifying it, simplifying a system, and you can do this if you think that gravity is not a major player in the process that you're trying to replicate. If you think gravity can become an important process, then using a sandbox model, you're not modeling and scaling the force of gravity correctly. In which case, that's when you start moving into a centrifuge system where you can generate g-forces in the ten thousands and scale the, the body forces, the gravity, in a totally different fashion. Okay? Good points. Um, okay, I'm just going to skip these right now and finish off with um, some numerical models that were done. Um, well, this is a ways back. This is in the 1990s, but this really profoundly changed how we started seeing how the origins evolved. And this work is, was done and pioneered by Chris Beaumont's group at Dalhousie University using numerical approaches, using finite element models, trying to model all these complexities, the generation of heat, fluctuating, evolving rheology, erosion, migration of material from one part of the origin to the next, and so forth. Okay, so they devised this initially fairly simple numerical model with the computational capacity of the 1990s. And as you know, computing um, evolved in the 20 years after, and the models that they're generating now are much more complex. But it's good to come back to the original ones to understand how they did this. Okay? So the first simple model was essentially trying to replicate the Jacques Malavier sandbox model with simple numerical approach. Okay? Um, and so they had the one plate here with a subduction system here. So this is the pro wedge side. This is the retro wedge side. And this is the predicted pro shear and retro shear that will define the basal contact of the two wedges. Okay? And as they ran the model, this is sort of a summary of what the model looks like. It evolved through a series of stages <coughs> around this point S, which is called the singularity point. This is the point where the, uh, the mylar sheet, or the numerical mylar sheet equivalent, comes down into the subduction system right here. Okay? And we're going to go through these three steps. Step one, very early in the deformation, and it doesn't require a lot of shortening here, the system will generate two major thrusts, opposite sets. Okay? And those will border a zone of uplift, of topographic uplift in the center. Okay? And everything is essentially moving up in between. As we go into step two, we the pro edge side evolves very quickly with a fairly low tapered angle, okay? And this is where you will see the development of the foreland full thrust belt, okay? If you continue uh, the, the modeling with increased shortening, the retro wedge right here becomes active, but it becomes active with a much steeper tapered angle. Finally, as the system evolves, we reach stage four. And in stage four, which is a stage that was not permitted with the Jacques Malavier sandbox model, uh, just because uh, one point the system <coughs> locks itself and the sand does not deform anymore. In stage four here, we have development of a very large interior plateau area. And because we're using numericals of codes here, that, and we can fluctuate rheology and also generate heat by simulated radiogenic heat production, we have the production of a very warm mid to lower continental crust that will weaken the central part of the origin. Okay, so we have this divergent nature of the origin, but we also now have um, 
a zone of high heat production underneath a high elevation plateau. Starting to resemble some natural prototypes that we see. Okay? The final step in all of this is to bring in the clouds. Erosion. And we all know by going to the Andes, going to the Himalaya, going to New Zealand, for example, it always rains a lot more on one side of the origin than the other. Okay? So asymmetric erosion will produce asymmetric removal of material, either on the pro side or the retro side, depending on which side the clouds are coming from and which side the erosion is more active and more aggressive. So if you erode more material, that could produce uh, more um, localized deformation to replenish that critical tapered angle, further driving more and more deformation in the process. So suddenly we're coming to realize that erosion patterns, and even where the clouds come from, the prevailing winds, can have a direct influence on where the active faults and where the major faulting episodes will occur in an evolving origin. Okay? So by removing material, we change the mass balance of the origin, and we also change the gravitational stresses of the entire system. Okay? These are my last slides for the break. So this led Chris Beaumont to this kind of diagram. So anyone who's done some uh, astrophysics, mm -hmm. or you may have taken one or a course or two of that, uh, may recognize this diagram right here. This is the um, uh, Hertzberg-Russell uh, diagram, I think it's called. It's the star classification diagram that looks at essentially the relationship between luminosity of stars and the temperature of stars. And uh, so what Chris Beaumont um, got inspired by this model and tried to come up with a classification of origins using magnitude and temperature on this plot. Magnitude refers to the deviation or increase thickness with respect to a stable, normal, unthickened continental crust. Okay? The higher magnitude origins will have the greatest continental thickening happening. And then temperature is the same way. The higher temperature origins are those that generate the most heat compared to the stable, undeformed continental crust. Okay? So the first thing that you'll notice on this diagram is this is the M equal T line, magnitude equal temperature. All origins do not fall on this line. Okay? They all fall below what does that mean? Why don't the main sequence of origins, whether they're small or big, not fall on the line of magnitude equal temperature? Any idea? Because you would need the temperature to increase first before you can have any movement? You're almost there. It has to do with, so the origins are plotting all on the right-hand side right there, okay? So for, there's more heat for the same amount of magnitude, so one way of seeing it. There's always a disproportional amount of heat being produced with a constant thickening process. There's just more heat in the system, and the more thickness you have, the more heat that you have the potential to produce by radioactive decay. Okay? So here you have fairly cold small origins, fairly hot origins right here and large magnitude, and of course you can then do the game of putting your favorite origin in the system. Uh, Himalayan origenic, uh, Himalayan Tibet system would be fairly hot and large. The Grenvillian origin, very similarly. Um, the Appalachian system, the Southern Alps of New Zealand, fairly cold uh, down here. You could try to think about Archean origins, if you believe uh, there was modern style tectonics operating in the Archean with a higher heat flow. The orogenic 
uh, path of uh, arcane origins may have this line right here with a much greater generation of heat, for example, and conversely not being able to sustain as thick a continental crust because the rocks are too hot. Why do we do this? Well, it's important then when we go back and start to model an orogenic system to think about what kind of origin it is in the first place. If we're trying to model the New Zealand Alps, for example, that plot down here, fairly cold, it would be appropriate to use a mechanical model. However, if we're dealing with the Himalayan system or the Granvillian system or the trans hudson system um, in the Proterozoic, if we're trying to model this origin, we would have to seriously think about the thermal processes as well. Okay, so depending on where we are, either the origin is governed by thermomechanical processes or dominantly by mechanical. Okay? And that will dictate which kind of model would be more appropriate when you're starting to um, think about processes of that origin. Okay? Any questions pertaining to this part? Okay? We'll take a little break, and then after that, I want to talk about exhumation. And we'll talk about clouds a little bit more so, and how clouds, raindrops, erosion, dictate exhumation patterns, where we find metamorphic rocks, and also how they can control localization of deformation at the continental scale as opposed to synthetic scale. Okay? So we'll take 10 minutes, and we'll come back. I didn't think that. Kingston's not that big. It shouldn't take an hour and a half. The buses just the buses yeah. like, no. <laughs> number two buses. buses. Um, and they crossed that just the bus stop that I was taking it at. So you went the wrong way? Yeah. Aww. Yeah. Very uh, I went very north. I was really confused where I was from. <laughs> <laughs> the best decision so probably probably the bus decision probably just sure. <laughs> Yeah, as opposed to yeah. <laughs> That's kind of funny, though. Um, <laughs> See anything interesting? Like um, me and no, no, no. My birthday. No, to be honest. Yeah, like all the gardeners in that area. I don't know where it was. It was like, yeah, like I don't know if you like. Go. The road Go. we drove this like bus. We pick up on the two twenty one. We here. I'm going that way. Like in my shelter, a little subdivision. Well, because like the whole place. It was like so bad. In that city, you can always get on the street. Sorry. And the best thing is I get. I'm trying to find a way that I can like still write and see and this. And become. It looks like you found it. You're mobile too. Well, I know, and like the Pretty differential between the height. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know so what I was Those chairs were so fast. Those chairs were the only ones I was doing in my life. Yes. But like you like, you 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 little 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 always wanted to play in the hall. Oh, yeah, you could play bowling. Yeah. 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 Human bowling yeah. with yeah. those yeah. chairs You totally could. That would be such a chair thing to be doing. <laughs> do, you, do you think this means double stuff in the hall? I have no clue. Read their platforms. Who questions actually has the platforms? Oh, I don't. Thank you. We're talking about our labs. 
I guess I'm sorry about how bad it was. <laughs> it was good. It wasn't that terrible. No. It wasn't. It was great. You're just very nice. Thank you. Thank Thanks to this one, I would run a couple of people. How are you? Wait, I bought some more That's a yeah, I don't know. 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 Yeah, I'm not sleeping. I'm not sleeping. I was falling asleep in Gemma's class today. I was also falling asleep in Gemma's class today. But I think it's more noticeable. We also wrote some basics. They're our friends. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. exactly. Uh, I mean, if I oh, grab yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Use, yeah and you use the... Uh, you know, you How do you use the bar? Yeah, yeah. first arrival, yeah. second yeah. arrival. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean... Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, I play in a funk band, yeah. and we have, our, we have a show on Saturday. So... Yeah. Yeah. So, we're yeah. practicing for that. Oh, well, that's fine. Do you want to come? Yeah. Saturday night at the Grand Club. Yeah, this Saturday. want to know, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, the tickets are 10 bucks to the door. Make sure that, yeah. Yeah. We're caught up for speed. <laughs> that she doesn't start. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's kind of like, that's kind of like, yeah. Yeah. you know, where my mind is not exploring. Uh, so they're, right. they're mostly oh, yeah. Queen's music students, and I met a couple of them through the orchestra. So, okay. okay. Like our, our, trumpet one, our trumpet player is the guy who played trumpet with an orchestra, and they needed a bass player. So I was like, sure, I'll play bass. So, yeah. 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 So musical. Just in a pen. Uh, I want I inspired him because he yeah. makes America great. Right. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fair enough. Sing in my uh, 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 and now you're Saturday, having a show about my, um, my commentary. That was your brother. I already have one. Right so we were just like, get 17 so emails. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 15. <laughs> Uh, so I was like, did anyone ask you? I like this. <laughs> We stayed out dancing till the end. Let's go to the first day. They turned off the game. I went right over to the I wonder how much your size wall is eventually put up. It's more. I wear some Okay, because next week is size wall. Yeah. Oh, uh, <laughs> man, oh, um, <laughs> people that can grab jump from my geophysics back in the studio. It's 2013. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It'll come. Yeah. I might have to put It'll a bit of a crash course. Oh, yeah. It's just really tempting that I like signed up for shifts on reading weeks so that all of them are going to have to happen. So on the Wednesday of reading week, I'm like, all right, is everyone okay? Read down the jump spiral staircase. All good? Good night. Yeah, I'm going to do this. Program program. Program. I discovered it last night. And he just was 
I think you only like the the Weird. I think if you want to find me home, I'm cool with that. Yeah. 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 Ye
No. Uh, <laughs> Simon Fraser, you guys look good. Uh, Toronto as well. That was always hilarious. Uh, Christy and Miguel, are you guys uh, look pretty thin there, but uh, got the thumbs up? Okay. Okay. All right. We all had to leave because I think Jane and I are going to have to leave at 3.21. So you'll be down to Baba. <laughs> well, it's being recorded, so I guess people can always come back. Yeah. That's the hope. All right, um, the second half, what I want to do is pursue on the modeling and, and talk about some terminology that uh, I think is very, very important. And we'll revisit uh, some of uh, Chris Beaumont's team's models uh, that factor in erosion and uh, talk about the role of erosion and exhumation of metamorphic rocks in the process. And to start off, I, I want to start with three very simple terms, and in fact, <coughs> two that I constantly hear being sort of used interchangeably, and, and, and it's unfortunate, uh, are the terms of exhumation versus uplift. And, <coughs> and essentially, the, the first thing we have to keep in mind is when you talk about exhumation in terms of rocks, Whenever you're doing field geology, you're doing geology of exhumed rocks. You're looking at rocks that were at some point at depth, and they are now at the surface. So they've been exhumed, and there's different ways of doing this. Okay? If a rock is being exhumed, it's not necessarily uplifting, is the other important uh, distinction to be made. Okay. Whenever you're talking about uplift, here we have to think about a reference frame. The reference frame in question is the geoid, okay, the surface of the Earth, model surface of the Earth. If you're talking about surface uplift, it's the surface moving up with respect to that geoid baseline. If you're talking about rock uplift, it's the displacement of rocks with respect to that same reference frame. Okay, so in essence, okay, you can think about these three terms with this very simple ex uh, equation, where surface uplift is essentially the product of rock uplift for which you subtract the exhumation component. Okay, so let's do a simple exercise here. Um, I'm just going to try to put myself in front of the camera. You put your hands like this, okay? Four fingers, four fingers, okay? The top of my fingers is the joint. Hey, Laura, we, okay. can't, we can't see you because we're looking at class or your slot. We mostly have your Okay, so hold on. Stop sharing. All right. There okay. we go. There you go. So you put your hands, fingertips. Okay. We see your class, but I don't see you. I think you're in front of us. <laughs> she needs that. There is the camera. This, this camera. Right. Oh, this is so awkward. <laughs> Hold on, let me change cameras. Oh, this is cool. uh, I, I, I know I can do this. Camera angle. Camera <laughs> hey, yeah, I got that. Hey. hey, I rule with technology here. And now you see me? Yeah. Okay. Can you see the fingertips to fingertips? Okay. The top of my index, my two fingers, is the top, is the geoid reference frame. Okay. Now, let's do a thrust, okay? And I put my two hands on top of each other, okay? The bottom finger here that was at four finger depth, thrust, is at what depth? <coughs> Still four fingers depth, okay? Now, first things first, thrusting, does not produce exhumation, okay? I've just done thrusting, okay? One hand has moved over the other hand, okay? The top finger is still at the same depth. Second finger is still at the same depth. And in fact, these fingers on my other hand have been buried, okay? 
This finger that was one finger depth is now the fifth finger depth. Okay? Thrusting produces burial, not exhumation. Okay? Now, if I want to do erosion, let's say I remove these two fingers here. Okay? So there's been surface uplift, right? Because these two fingers now are on top of, right? There's been surface uplift. There's been rock uplift as well with respect to the geoid. And there's been two fingers exhumation, okay? But for this, the exhumation process is independent to that of the thrusting, okay? So just keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to the content sharing now. Okay. Yes, okay. So if you put your two hands on top of each other, you essentially bring, you know, creating significant surface uplift with respect to the geoid. And if you remove the exhumation, what you're left, right, is the rock uplift component. Okay, so the way to produce topography, of course, is to move rock material with respect to the geoid. But if you're trying to expose rocks that were once deeply buried, you need to invoke another process altogether. Okay? So where do we have exhumation processes operating around the planet? Well, there's all sorts of different tectonic settings that it's, uh, where it's happening. Uh, oceanic rifts and transform faults, continental rift zones, subduction zones, and continental, continental collision zones, okay? The numbers that are put in this summary diagram here, okay, are the maximum depth of rocks that can be exhumed in these four different tectonic environments, okay? So in continental uh, convergence zones, you can expose rocks through exhumation processes, rocks that were once buried at 70 to 80 kilometers depth, for example. Okay? Uh, whereas in oceanic crust, uh, in divergent systems, at spreading ridges, usually it's not greater than five kilometers. Okay? So each tectonic se setting will have a limit <coughs> to how deeply exhumed rocks uh, can produce exhumed rocks. Okay? So in oceanic rifts, we can produce oceanic core complexes along spreading ridges. So where, what's being exhumed in this scenario here, right, especially right near the spreading ridge, are um, essentially upper mantle rocks that are coming in very close to the surface. This map here is a map from the uh, Oman Ophiolite, and what you're seeing here are dome, domal structures in the ultramafic rocks. And what these domal structures represent are centers of spreading along an oceanic spreading ridge that has been later abducted onto continental crust. These arrows here point towards crystallographic preferred orientation measured in olivine. And you'll notice that these spreading directions, quantified by CPOs of olivines, are radial. Okay? Meaning that the rocks are doming upwards and spreading laterally. And this is very typical of oceanic core complexes along spreading ridges. And usually these line up. in zones of major extension, spreading ridges. Okay. And in the Oman Ophiolite, for example, uh, with detailed mapping and microstructural analysis, we can actually reconstruct the geometry of this abducted spreading ridge, which is kind of neat. The rocks, though, that have been exhumed in the process, uh, you cannot exhume more than the actual thickness of oceanic crust. So we've got a maximum limit there. In continental rifts or extensional zones, such as in Death Valley, for example, um, or the East African Rift, 
We'll have the opportunity to expose deeply buried rocks, but usually not greater than 25 kilometers depth. That's controlled essentially by the geometry of the normal sense detachment, okay? And by doing a lot of extension, such as in the basin and range province, we can then exhume the foot wall in the foot wall of detachment faults. Normal sense detachment faults. Another place where we can find exhumed rocks that were once buried at depth are in subduction zones. This system here is driven by buoyancy forces. As we bring in material in the trench, usually these materials are being dragged through the subduction system, but they're fairly buoyant. Okay? And at one point, they don't like being at depth, and they come back to the surface. And they become either Blucius or Franciscan melange type rocks that have recorded this high, uh, high pressure condition at the toe of the accretionary prism. <coughs> and then they come back to the surface. Okay? So this return flow is a way to exhume rocks. The thickness that will be allowed to be exhumed in the system is directly controlled <coughs> by the geometry of the wedge itself. Okay? So rocks, we won't be able to have exhumed rocks that have been deeper than this point right there. Okay? Because that's the end of the wedge itself in the subduction system. Okay? Usually in the range of 30 to 40 kilometers depth. Finally, in large continental collision zones, this is one of the areas where we can find rocks that were once buried sometimes up to 100 kilometers depth and come back to the surface. And this is the world of ultra high pressure rocks, diamond bearing rocks. Um, in the Kohistan block in nor uh, north of Pakistan, okay, so Islamabad is uh, somewhere around, around here. Um, so this is Pakistan, and in the Kuistan range right here, we have a very steep seismic zone right here, a fairly steeply dipping continental subduction system with huge return flow of eclogenic rocks okay, that are coming back to the surface, and they're coming back with metamorphic conditions recording 100 kilometers depth. Okay. There's huge problems with UHP, and I don't want to open up you know, a, an entire course on how to exhume UHP rocks. Uh, that's, that's a topic for a full-term course. So if we want to simplify how to exhume rocks, there's really two different ways to do this. Either you remove what's on top, or you bring what's at depth through the surface. Okay. If you want to remove the overburden, you can do this by erosion. That's the simplest thing. Exhumation is operating right now everywhere. There's erosion. We could remove what's on top by normal faulting. Okay? So again, thrusting does not exhume rock. Erosion does. Normal faulting can as well. It removes the hanging wall, exposing the foot wall. Okay? Or we could vertically thin the lithosphere. If you take out a silly putty block and you stretch it, right, the bottom block will become closer and closer to the surface just because you're horizontally stretching. Okay? So stretching, horizontal stretching, or vertical lithospheric thinning can exhume rocks in the process. Okay? The other group of um, exhumation processes involves vertical transport of material. Okay? Think of salt diapirs, for example. The salt gets exhumed in diapiric zones because of negative buoyancy of salt in the continental crust moving up and exhuming the process. Okay? Return flow in subduction systems is also a buoyancy-driven process where rocks that are negatively, uh, that are buoyant, will come back 
to the surface. Okay. Now, let's talk about rates now, because this is important. Which of these processes is more efficient? Can exhume rocks the fastest? And it really depends on what tectonic setting you're looking at. Let's just think about erosion. Okay? Erosion is highly varied around the planet. You can be in areas where there's virtually no erosion, to areas where erosion is incredibly aggressive um, and very efficient, okay? So this diagram here is just looking at river erosion, okay? and it's essentially a summary of all the erosion rates documented in uh, rivers around the world. And essentially on average, rivers have an erosion rate it can, or an erosion power of about 50 meters per million of years. Okay. However, some river systems can be very, very aggressive. Five to 13 kilometers of material can be removed by some of the more aggressive, efficient river systems. Okay? That's a lot of material. In one million year, you could expose green shift species rocks. Okay? just by erosion alone. Okay? And of course, erosion will be most efficient if you've got a lot of topography, if you've got a lot of precipitation, and even more so if it's assisted by tectonic activity, namely normal faults, for example. Okay? So exhumation processes can team up. Okay? And I've put this diagram here just to remind you of the erosional power of the Himalayan system. Okay. Himalaya is huge topography, we know that, uh, but it also loses a lot of material. This map represents all the different uh, basins that are actively forming around the Himalayan system that are trapping the erosional product, all the erosion uh, sediment, sediments eroded from the Himalayan Tibetan system. In the Bengal fa fan, for example, we have up to 12 kilometers thick sediments being accumulated. These are all Himalayan detritus piling up right here, 12 kilometers thick, but eight to 10 kilometers thick in the Indus fan. And all these basins, so there's virtually an entire Himalayan chain preserved in the basins all around the Himalayan system as well. Okay, so it's very aggressive, very efficient. Normal faulting can also be uh, quite efficient in terms of rates. We're talking about exhumation rates in the seven to nine kilometers per million years, which will be a direct uh, factor of how fast the normal fault is operating and also the dip of the normal fault too. Okay. You've got a steep normal fault or a shallow normal fault, the vertical throw that you'll have on the fault will be very, very different, which will control also the amount of exhumation of the footwall rocks. Okay. We can use thermochronology or cooling ages on a regional perspective to document whether or not the exhumation that we're seeing in a system is controlled by the fault, or normal fault, or by erosion. So if we do, let's say, argon thermochronology or uh, appetite fission track using the low temperature thermochronometers, and we'll talk about those later on in the term, um, and you find uh, you don't find any relationship between the cooling ages of your rock versus the position of your faults, well, then you can suspect erosion. If you have a sharp break in your cooling ages across a fault that has normal sense, then you can suspect that the normal fault is the key player in the exhumation process. And finally, the horizontal thinning or a vertical thickening, horizontal stretching uh, system, the ductile flow process, is in itself very in inefficient. Because here we're dealing with ductile processes, creep. Creep moves at tectonic plate velocity. 
that's very, very slow. Okay? So horizontal stretching will operate at plate tectonic velocities. So in terms of uh, exhumation power, we're talking about less than a kilometer per million year to maybe at most four kilometers per million years. Okay? Nonetheless, it can couple and team up with another exhumation process at work, let's say normal faulting, to become quite efficient. Okay, so now let's look at a mountain system. And of course, you know, this is sort of my inclination when I talk about these things, go back to the Himalayan Tibet system. Um, and here we're looking at just a general topographic map of the Himalayan Tibetan system. The red colors represent elevations above five kilometers above sea level. And purple right here, on average, 100 to 200 meters above sea level. And of course, what we see right away is this huge area of high elevation in the Tibetan Plateau and also a very steep rise in topography on the southern flank of the Himalayan system, going from sea level to over eight kilometers in elevation. If we look at the same map now, and instead of looking at elevation, we look at slope gradient, where it's good to go ski. Of course, you don't go ski in Tibet. Not very good. One, it's dry, so you'll ski on rocks, but two, there's no slope. It's pretty flat. Um, where you do want to ski, if you've got the lungs for it, would be in Pakistan, in Nepal, in Bhutan, on the southern flank of the Himalayan system is where you have the steepest slopes, the highest gradient. Now let's look at the same map now from a precipitation perspective. And we all know the Indian monsoon uh, coming in from, from the Indian Ocean, all the moisture in summertime. And of course it's moving northward and hits the orographic barrier of the Himalaya, and then all the clouds lose their water right there. So the greatest precipitation is on the sun flank of the Himalaya, namely in the eastern part in Bhutan, north of Bangladesh, eastern ne Nepal, and as you move towards Pakistan, then the clouds lose more and more of their moisture and erosional power. The backside of the origin, dry. Why do I present this? Well, there's a direct relationship between where you have deformation coupled with climate and erosional um, exhumational processes. And in the Himalayan system, we have this loop that seems to be operating, where the Tibetan plateau has been uplifted in the last 15 million years or so, dramatic rise of topography, interacting with atmospheric circulation and buildup of this orographic barrier. That in turn strengthened the Asian monsoon effect and the erosional pattern on the southern flank of the Himalaya. So you're eroding and removing a lot of material on the south flank, producing a lot of erosionally driven exhumation, in the process removing cold crust, and because the origin is active, that cold crust that has been removed and dumped in the Indus fan and all the basins will be replaced by warmer rocks, metamorphosed rocks. Hot rocks tend to be weaker, will tend to localize deformation more easily. That in turn generates more surface uplift, more deformation, thrust related deformation linked to topographic uplift further enhancing the orographic barrier and the monsoonal interaction. So there's a direct feedback loop between tectonic processes and climate uh, processes. And it's all intertwined. And as an example of how powerful the system can be, I bring you uh, just to the north, uh, northern part of Pakistan here, where the Himalayan system is taking a very sharp bend right there. This is called a syntaxis, sort of the corner of an origin, almost at 90 degrees there. So there's a space issue right there. The two plates are moving relative to each other, north-south, northeast-southwest, okay? And on top of that right here, I'm gonna use a different color here, actually use blue, but is the Indus River. 
one of very powerful rivers in terms of erosional uh, capacity. Okay, that's flowing right through uh, northern Pakistan and the Himalayan range. So we have here a great place to study the interaction of river erosion, climatic erosion, and movement of ductile rocks to replace the coal rocks that are being removed by erosion. And the system is so efficient that if you go on the summit of Nanga Parbat, right there, okay, and you climb there and you pick up a rock, It'll be a metamorphic rock that will have monazites that grew at about 26 kilometers depth 1.8 million years ago. Okay? So think about it. This crystal in this rock went from 28 kilometers depth to 8 kilometers above sea level in less than 2 million years. Okay? So there's rock uplift significant exhumation, and of course, topographic uplift that created this high range in the process, okay? in less than two million years. So it can be very, very dramatic. Uh, just for comparison, if you date a rock using uranium-led geochronology and you date a Grenvillian granite or a transhudson um, pegmatite, you'll get 1.8 billion years plus or minus maybe one or two million years in era. Well, in two million years, you can create this with an error of a geochronological analysis of Proterozoic rock. Okay? Things can happen very, very quickly, is the take home message here. Okay? Okay, so <clears throat> now what I want to do to finish off is go back to Chris Beaumont's model, okay? where we have the pro edge, retro edge operating, and we have the singularity point, we have this. Uh, continental mantle that's coming down underneath here, the singularity point right here, plate A on the left, plate B on the right, okay? The pro wedge is on this side, the retro wedge is on this side. We'll redo these experiments now, but adding clouds to the system. Clouds coming from one way or clouds coming from the other way. That will trigger localized erosion, removal of part of the material, which will change the mass balance of the system. Okay? And this material will move from high topography area and then trap into basins away from the topographic highs. So this is the model set up here. We have the pro wedge, the retro wedge. We use the same finite element model, okay? And we'll produce topography that will react to where the deformation is being driven, but also by where the erosion is more aggressive. So we'll generate slopes of various steepness depending on the erosional capacity uh, generated by uh, precipitation. Okay. So let's just look at a series of meshes now. No erosion whatsoever. So that's time zero, time two, time six of different increments. And you start off with a mesh that's equal spacing and topography is flat. We have the singularity point right there, okay, and we generate topography, and I'll just draw topography like this, okay, that's the top of the model, <clears throat> and in black here are the zones of the high strain rates, those are fault zones, okay, we start with a general pop-up structure that was predicted by the simple sandbox model of Jacques Malavier, we end up culminating into a large plateau zone, okay, with two different critical wedges angle on either the pro and the retro wedge. So that's essentially replicating exactly what we talked about before the break. Let's now look at the same system with constant erosion, okay? So that's rain, 
falling on our system in equal, <coughs> okay? Erosion is constant throughout the system, okay? So now topography, okay? There's topography there, the, the top of the surface there. will very quickly reach a steady state, okay? You'll notice that the topographic profile on all three is pretty much the same. The highest ground is almost at the center part of the system, okay? Rocks will then migrate where there's more exhumation. Because there's exhumation uh, occurring simultaneously everywhere, all the mesh that is seen here above the green line is material that's been eroded away, okay? So the end product, where will we see the highest metamorphic grade rocks in this system, in the end product? Will it be in the pro wedge or the retro wedge side? Retro side. Okay. All of this material here has been removed, okay? And part of that is erosion, and the material that's replacing it is being moved from the pro wedge into the retro wedge side of the model. Okay? So here it's predicted that with a constant erosion, we will have the highest grade metamorphic rocks outcropping at low elevation in the system on the retro wedge side. Okay? Everything else being equal. Okay? Now, let's change where the clouds <coughs> come from, okay? And look at the same system, pro wedge on the left side. Okay, here's the pro wedge. This is the retro wedge side, pro wedge, retro wedge side. So the first model on top, okay, the clouds are coming in from the pro wedge, okay? Everything above the line here has been eroded away by those clouds coming in from the left side, okay? The, where we will find the highest metamorphic grade rocks, right, will be close to the topographic high, but on the pro edge side, okay? If we just Keep the deformation identical, but change where the clouds come from. The system's going to be very, very different. Here we'll have a very narrow zone of metamorphic rocks, exposed at very low elevation on the retro wedge side. Okay. Now, deformation in this case is not dictating where metamorphic rocks come to the surface. Erosion does. Kind of mind-boggling to when you start thinking about it. Okay. Now, if you have very aggressive erosion, think New Zealand. Think uh, I, I'm going to show you an example of the uh, Olympic Mountains uh, in Seattle area on the west coast. Think the Himalayan system. Okay. Very very high erosional rates now. If you have a lot, very strong retro edge exhumation. The metamorphic belt will be very, very narrow, okay, and pretty significant. All this material has been eroded away, so this point here has been exhumed by this thickness right there, okay? And you'll have a very narrow belt of metamorphic rock exposed at very low elevations on the retro side. If you have a lot of clouds, a lot of erosion coming from the pro wedge side, you'll have a somewhat more diffuse zone of metamorphic rocks on outcrop. And the highest metamorphic grade rocks will be found very close to the topographic divide of your mountain bed. Okay, let's go back, away stepping back from the models towards a natural prototype. You've talked about New Zealand, you've looked at some New Zealand rocks. This is the South Island uh, rocks, the Alpine Schist. You all know by now that metamorphic grade 
increases towards the Alpine Fault, which is right there, okay? And it increases very rapidly, and the high metamorphic grade rocks are found very close to the coastline, almost at sea level, okay? If you look at the precipitation map of New Zealand, I think I've already told you this, there's only three days of sunny weather in, uh, uh, along the west coast of the South Island. Close to eight meters of water a year falls on the west coast there. It's wet, okay? Um, that means erosion is coming in from this side right there, okay? In cross-section, okay, this is the subduction system coming down here, okay, so this is the pro wedge side, this is the retro wedge, okay, so here we have retro wedge intense erosion, and again, the model predicts that we'll have exhumation of metamorphic rocks at very low elevation on the retro wedge side of the origin. Okay, which is exactly what you see in New Zealand. Okay? Not saying this is the truth, just saying this model is consistent with the observations. And it's a fairly elegant, simple way of explaining why you find upper green schist, or actually amphibolite facies rocks, at not even 100 meters elevation in New Zealand. Okay? If you go in the Olympic Mountains in Washington, the tectonic setting is very different in this case here. We have a subduction system operating right here, okay? So the pro wedge side is on this side here, and the retro wedge is on this side here. If you look at a metamorphic map of the Olympic Mountains, which is right here, just south of Victoria, we have a fairly broad metamorphic culmination. That's documented by the metamorphic isograds right here. And this bullseye of metamorphic grade rocks coincides also with the bullseye of very intense precipitation. There too, it rains a lot. Okay? So in this case here, erosion's coming in from the pro wedge side. Okay? So here we go, pro wedge erosion coming in. <clears throat> there's a model, there's the finite element model result. The topographic divide is right there. Okay. Here you have a fairly broad metamorphic culmination. All this material here has been removed, okay? But it's not defining a narrow linear belt of metamorphic rock. Contrary to that, it exposes a fairly broad domal uh, metamorphic complex, okay? No clear exhumation front. Again, we haven't changed anything in the deformation, just the clouds. Okay, so <clears throat> where do people uh, go with this mo these models now? And of course, you know, this was in the 90s and early 2000s. Computing has completely changed and become a lot more powerful. Uh, the new generations of models now are factoring th complex things like azostasy, thermal, complex thermal evolution. And I would like to add what's coming up, of course, is three-dimensional numerical models now to look at lateral variations of some of this erosion rate. So for example, in the Himalaya, we know the eastern part of the belt is being eroded a lot more aggressively than the western part. How is material particles migrating in the orogenic system in the third dimension is something that the new generations of models um, hopefully will provide insight. Okay. So, in summary, the, the last points I want to make, okay, is, you know, when you're looking at rocks that have been exhumed, it's, it's a valid exercise to think about how they were exhumed. It might be related to deformation, it may not, okay? There could be an interplay between deformation and climate, and, and of course, people have started playing around with older orogenic systems. I think Paul Hoffman and, uh, and colleague have tried this exercise in Proterozoic mountain belts, looking at exhumation patterns. 
to try to recreate what was the direction of prevailing winds in the Proterozoic. Okay. Uh, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt, um, but you could certainly make some analogies with some of the numerical models uh, that I've showed you, and also with the observations that we see in New Zealand, in the Himalaya, or in the Kenyan Cordillera. Okay. So erosion versus <coughs> the mass balance of origin. It can then help localize faults that can then assist migration of particles and enhance exhumation in particular parts of the origin. Okay, this is really what I want to talk about. I think that's it for me. Uh, that was essentially a broad scope, moving away from microtectonics a little bit, take a break, think about bigger scale processes, and uh, to open up the door to Yajing, who will talk about next week this about earthquakes. And uh, from here on, then we'll migrate from McGill to, I can't remember what the rest of the menu afterwards, uh, but we'll move towards Toronto, Vancouver, and back to McGill uh, later on as well. Any questions on anything that I said from either Queens, Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal? All good? All good, all good. <laughs> okay. That's it. Uh, do we have anything about the lab that we want to mention? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, remote locations, if you guys have any questions pertaining to the labs, uh, send us an email. Don't let it linger and wait the day before you have to hand in. Uh, your lab. Uh, we're available as a Skype or just by email if we can answer any of your questions. As of 4.30 this afternoon, quiz number two becomes online. Similar to quiz number one, uh, you have a time limit to, uh, to do it. Uh, I think I believe I, I gave you until next Friday to do it and then oh, yeah. once it's done. Oh, good, then. until next Friday. Okay. Alright, we're good. Uh.